Yes, you are with, well, I call it the Information Project. You are with the platform. Me, Sean Plunkett, with you through until 10 o'clock. Well, I've just told you that we have, and a reputable poll shows that the platform has got the highest neutral rating amongst 1,000 polled New Zealanders, um, the highest neutral attitude rating, which I'm very proud of. But there have been a few polls... Surveys, graphs out lately suggesting that our news media is by and large wi- widely, widely left wing. Also research out suggesting that people don't trust the news media anymore. I'm thinking the two things might be related and there is something going on here. And a guy who I think uh, comes traditionally from the left but gives a pretty good uh, view of everything from everywhere is political commentator Chris Trotter. He joins us now. Hey, Chris, nice to have you back on the platform. Welcome. Thank you for um, having me. Uh, Sean, and congratulations on that neutrality rating. Uh, I think that is something to be proud of. Look, as I pointed out, Chris, um, we don't get Labour on. We've, there seems to be a ban. I know there's an official ban from the Green Party on us. Uh, Maori Party don't seem keen. So I am left, literally, if I want to have people do an interview on my program, talking to politicians from, I guess, the new smaller parties, New Zealand First, ACT. I get national MPs on, but not the national leader. So I always expected that our overall rating would come out to the right. Um, but it seems to me the overall ratings and all the polling we've seen on perceptions of media tells us they either are in general, or are perceived to be very, very left. Yes, and that's been the case really um, for the last uh, 40 or 50 years um, in this country and in the English-speaking countries uh, around the world. And I think that's partly to do uh, with what happened in the 60s and early 70s I think it's got an awful lot to do um, with the romanticisation of of journalism that followed um, the Watergate scandal when uh, Woodward and Bernstein, um, superbly played by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman in the movie, um, gave gave journalism this this extraordinary frisson of uh, speaking truth to power um, journalists were seen as uh, capable of bringing down presidents, uh, and uh, and I think a whole generation um, yeah. uh, sort of climbed on board. <laughs> yeah. And and you're 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 talking to one of them, yeah. um, and uh, and so I think that there was always a bit of a left lean after that. Um, but I think what's happened more recently. Uh, is something else. Um, I wrote a piece for interest.co just the other day um, where I pointed out something which I noticed, you know, just in my own personal interactions with people, particularly those working uh, at universities. What they told me, and I really struggled with this just in terms of believing it, but I, I... I I have come to believe it, is that a whole generation has come into the universities which is considerably more fragile psychologically um, than you and I would believe possible. And what the universities, who after all now charge the students to learn, is that they they have become very, very sensitive to the sensitivities of students. And many of the lecturers and the professors have tended to reassure their students by presenting only one version of the truth uh, because it's a whole lot more reassuring Uh, for people, particularly young people, to be told that this is the answer, this is the truth, all the other things you hear are wrong, so just hold on to this and you'll be fine. Um, Now that 
that may reassure people psychologically, but, but from an academic and, and particularly from a journalistic perspective, it, it's just um, fatal. It's, it's, it's the worst possible thing. There that, can be no, no dissent because, you know, <laughs> we can't give you the truth, you can't handle the truth. It's like a few good men, isn't it? <laughs> well, 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 yes, um, and there's, there's, there's an overlay to this, of course, as well. Um, what what some people have described as the left's long march through the institutions, um, and so the truth that has been promulgated, particularly in the liberal arts, particularly in communication studies and the like, journalism schools. The truth that's that's been presented as as the only um, answer um, has a decidedly left wing slant. So you've got this perfect storm developing where people who are ideologically driven towards a certain set of answers about the questions um, that we all face in this world is meeting a generation that is sensitive, if not actually terrified of the confusion um, and the proliferation yeah. of viewpoints in the world. And so what emerges from the universities uh, is a generation that finds it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to embrace the idea that there are at least two sides and often more. many more than that. Um, to the big issues of this world. Yeah. They believe that all of the answers have been discovered. All of the questions have been resolved. And if you come with a different viewpoint... You're a um, Nazi. Especially, You're yeah, a Nazi, Chris. Especially one yeah, which reflects a conservative or a right-wing view of the world, then you aren't just wrong, but you're evil. Yeah, the problem is, Chris, isn't it? That those people who have been through that system are now our journalists, yeah, and, and I think that's that, the problem. <laughs> yeah, and the problem. Not just journalists, <laughs> they're editors, mate. <laughs> and they are now the editors and, and and the news bosses. And look, I saw I think Dieter De Bono from uh, NBR, um, absolutely lambasting on, on uh, I think it was LinkedIn last night a survey that came out of Massey University from James Hollings which he surveyed journalists about their political leanings or inclinations. It found out they were hugely left. I took part in that survey, and it was academically and possibly properly created. And Dieter de Bono's going, oh, I'm not going to... Who would ever survey journalists about their political leaning? This is just more of the imported culture war crap, which seems to be the new catch cry for those who are caught out doing poor journalism now is I'm not, and Andrea Vance did it to me the other day, oh, this is all imported culture war crap. We're not in the culture wars. And they always say that when they've just won or lost a battle uh, in the culture wars or been called out for fighting in the culture wars, Chris. So uh, journalists are not helping themselves by not looking at the problem that we have. Well... I couldn't agree more, which was why I was um, delighted uh, that TVNZ's Laura Frickberg had actually pulled together an item on political debate. Uh, and it was run, I think, on Saturday um, on the 6 o'clock news bulletin. Now, I thought that was a very interesting straw in the wind because the context out of which that item arose was, of course, the um, furore which uh, has only grown in relation to the role the New Zealand news media played, and we'll just leave aside the role that New Zealand's political class played, but the role that the New Zealand news media, mainstream news media played in demonising Kelly J. Keane Mitchell, a.k.a. Posey Parker, and the events that took place in Albert Park. Um, when her Let Women Speak uh, um, event was... Most of our crushed. listeners are aware of what went on there, Chris, yeah. and Crush yeah. was. Yeah, well, was you've led the charge on that, and, and, and once again, congratulations for doing so. But it has made an impact, um, I think, uh, 
especially the, the eyewitness accounts. I think those journalists um, who more or less conform to what we would understand the journalists to be, I think, were rather shaken by that event. And, and the subsequent I, lack of coverage or exactly. cognitively, and we collectively, our mainstream media collectively had cognitive dissonance. Well, that's right. That's right. And and in this day and age when everyone's got a cell phone with a video um, function, you just can't hide the truth the way that, that uh, state media and, and the big private uh, publishing and, and broadcasting firms were able to hide things in the past, you know, because they were the gatekeepers. They, they encountered you know, dissenting opinions at the gates and said you can't come in. But now people just turn their phones on and you can see some huge fellow pounding the 70-year-old woman. It's very hard for the media to run, or the mainstream media anyway, to run this line that this was a celebration of peace and love. You know, when someone's got a drone overhead filming what looks like a mob yeah. attacking... Yeah, it um, wasn't a drone. Uh, I've talked to the guy who did that. It was a, uh, it was on a big long stick and he was testing it well, out because he was going to go hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro or something. Um, okay. I've talked well, to the guy well, good who did on that. Because, yeah. because, yeah, I mean, the, the perspective made it perfectly clear what was going on. Yeah. But I think I think the the fact that the way that whole issue was firstly presented to the people of New Zealand, I mean, this was someone who was Nazi adjacent, yeah, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then the actual footage of what took place, the video recordings of what actually happened. I think some journalists were given pause and and began to think, did did we cover that properly? Are, are we actually guilty of incitement? Isn't it isn't it time that perhaps um, we started thinking about those matters all the old journalists talk about, you know, like presenting both sides of the story, maintaining a neutral stance, letting all sides have their say. Um, maybe that was the way to do things. Maybe the media has a role in facilitating debate and making it possible in a democracy. Maybe Rather than perpetuating uh, cancel culture. Exactly. Maybe that's what we should be doing instead of just saying one side right, one side wrong, victory to the mm. Viet Cong. Mm. Um, I think it was an important moment, Chris, and for the reasons that you described, yet we see no real commitment from the mainstream media to mend their ways. And they work in a context, and I mentioned this Curia poll, and I mentioned the fact that I am cancelled. The platform is cancelled by Labour and the Greens. That That is yeah, the way that, they... As you say, mm. as you say that, that's, that's just cutting off your nose to spot your face. I mean, what it shows... And, you know, just parenthetically, I think that's why Kieran McNulty has made such a breakthrough um, in, a, in a way, um, is, is that it, it really helps if you, if you acknowledge that there is a debate and then start participating in it. Yeah. I mean, that's the essence of democratic politics. It's not that you can't have a radical point of view. It's that you need to convince people that your radical point of view is a valid one. Mm. And you, you can't do that unless you are willing to debate and particularly unless the mainstream news media is willing to debate. How can you have ideas tested if somebody somewhere encounters an idea and says, oh, that's clearly wrong, that's fascist, and just throws it away. We're not having that on our program. Yeah. I mean, it, it, 
Yeah. I, co- look, I, co- I'm co- co- I mean, co-governance is a, is a very scary idea to a lot of people. Yeah. But you can't make it work if you don't talk about it. Uh, that's why I was, yeah. I was so proud of, of Kieran Mc, Mc, McAnulty because he actually he said least, it. And he said it in yeah. public. Yeah, and we kind of, yeah. now we're and, having and the debate. Put, and, and he put it, he put up his ideas. He 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 he, he ran, you know, a, a, a series of lines. And that's great. That's the way you play politics. Now the people who disagree with them should be able to present Yeah, and, that, and that's what we're into. Yeah. yeah. Chris, yeah. the, the other amazing thing is this idea, and my colleagues in the press gallery, when I asked that question to the Prime Minister, um, you know, what is a woman, which I thought in the context of what <laughs> Keir Starmer said was a perfectly legitimate question to ask at the press conference that a Prime Minister should have been prepared for and had a cogent answer to. Um, and my colleagues in the press gallery, particularly I think Jenna Lynch, hissed behind me and swore when I asked the question under her breath. They oh, all went, and yeah. they all said I was uh, I was motivated by this and that, and of course, and it was a terrible question to ask. They all went and ran off and asked every other politician they could find the same question, but also the strong narrative came through from the next week. It wasn't about the prime minister's failure to answer that question. It was about the fact that it was a culture war cre- question and culture wars don't exist in New Zealand and it's all imported right-wingism. It was a remarkable narrative. Um, and I see it repeated and repeated in criticisms of me and correspondence to me from Andrea Vance on social media in the last week. There is a culture war here, isn't it? Isn't there? We live in a global world. Um, these ideas and the issues we're talking about are part of the culture war, aren't they? Well, yes, and culture wars have raged across New Zealand, um, well, I mean, at least since the late 1960s. I mean, what was Patricia Bartlett and her her, her war against pornography? What was the extraordinary um, battle that raged um, everywhere on on the, the subject of abortion? I mean, we, we we seem to think that abortion is a settled question now, but by God, it wasn't a settled question back in the back in the nineteen seventies. I mean, it was it was it was something which, hell, I was in the Labour Party. The Labour Party was split right down the middle over abortion. Um, institutions across the country divided on that question. They divided over the question of whether we should be playing sport with apartheid. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how people can even sort of form the idea that this is something new and imported from the United States. No, it's not. Culture wars um, are very old. The actual expression comes from German. Um, Kulturkampf. The, 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 the cultural struggle between Protestant and Catholic Germany once Germany was uh, was united by Otto von Bismarck. That's going back a ways. That's 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 not yesterday's news. That's that's you know uh, centuries past news. But that's that's where the expression comes from. Okay. Where do we and, go, Chris? Where do we go, Chris? And it's Jesus. It's good talking to you. At, uh it calms my furrowed brow, to be honest, because <laughs> I know I'm not crazy. I sometimes sit and think, I'm crazy. Am I just seeing this all wrong? Oh, no. Oh, Chris gets it. <laughs> um, where do we go from here? What happens? I mean, we've seen today FM that, you know, went woke and went broke and, of course, endorsed a- and had the false narrative about events in Albert Park. Um, we have yeah. a news media that is now battling with Elon Musk, uh, you know, the government-funded RNZ, uh, and saying, oh, we're just going to throw our, 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 our toys out of the cot and not be on Twitter oh. anymore. Um, oh, I, just, I, I, just, I just love Elon Musk. I mean, he didn't really want to buy Twitter. He kind of outmaneuvered himself into ending up with his $44 million acquisition. Billion. Billion. But then... But then, yeah, 44 billion, that's right. Um, and then he discovers what the F has been going on here. This platform, alongside apparently Google and Facebook, has been working hand in glove with the United States national security apparatus for years. 
they've been censoring people, uh, people on a list supplied to them by these these new experts in disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. I love that last one, malinformation. In case you were wondering, yeah, malformation. Anything you anything you disagree with, basically. But these are all defined by the state, and the state um, went to Twitter, went to Google, went to YouTube, went to all the big social media platforms, and said. Now, which would you rather have? The state regulating you up the wazoo, or maybe you'd like to cooperate with us? Yeah. And they all said, well, we'd rather cooperate with, with you. you. What, Musk, what Musk has done is say, if that, and he slipped all these files to journalists like Matt Taibbi, who yeah. has now become, by the way, public enemy number, number one, one of course. for the left in America for daring, yeah. you know, to to, yeah. to make all this public. But I mean, this is and we link this back. We can link this back to New Zealand. Jacinda Ardern is oh, yeah. part of this. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Everywhere where the five eyes gaze, this process has been set in motion. I mean, we have our disinformation project here. Um, there are disinformation projects all over the English-speaking world, all over the world uh, that belongs to the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Partnership. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this uh, even in the Shire, Sean, even in the Shire, Mordor's Reach, um, has has uh, manifested itself. Hey, Chris, so, do you mind if we keep know, going? I know it's been long, but we're really getting down to some stuff here. Do you mind no, keep, keep no, doing good? Okay. No. So when I feel, and I've been going at the Disinformation Project for, I don't know, been a year now, or a year almost, and I've always had the feeling that they are more than what they seem, that there is a coordinate, coordinated, dare I say, method to the madness of the call-out culture that they practice and that they have been having secret meetings that I don't get invited to with journalists and that's why they pop up so regularly on our mainstream media saying that there's genocidal levels of hate against one group or another and they are never critically, they are never critiqued by our mainstream media. We never ask them where they get their money from or exactly who they are or who they work to? Well, um, the simple fact of the matter is that the whole disinformation project, um, as a concept and as a you know, project with a small p, came from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, and we can only imagine uh, the inspiration <laughs> for the DPMC in terms of this, this project. Um, but the interesting thing is, if you read Taibbi's stuff based on um, the Twitter files, you find that that the state is very, very quick to shuck off um, direct involvement. Um, although, you know, I mean, the Americans w were were slightly uh, more gung ho about this, but but the trick is, the, you set this stuff up but then you pass it to the universities or you pass it to a think tank um, or you pass it to some sort of NGO because, you know, <laughs> even they are smart enough to realise this doesn't look good, the state telling people what to think. Um, so maybe we should give it to someone else, you know, cover it with the mantle of academia or whatever um, because um, the conspiracy theorists will point at us quite rightly and say, oi, you're trying to influence yeah. the views of the and, and, it's, <laughs> and getting back to where we started, it is the job of the journalist to speak truth to power. Yes. But this is where the power lies now, and we are not speaking truth to that power, or our mainstream media aren't. They are too busy attacking white cis men and straight people, Chris. The real power has shifted and moved, and it is hard to find, and it hides itself. But that's where well, we are failing, and the news media are failing, and interviews like this aren't failing. Interviews like this are doing the job, Chris. 
I mean, I, I guess what I would say is the the news media in in countries like ours, um, liberal democratic capitalist societies. I mean, the news media has never been entirely clean handed. I mm. mean, it 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 has always play the game of politics. I mean, you only have to look at what happens to those who step too far away from what is considered orthodox thinking. They, they don't usually fare very well, um, even in a democracy. Um, it's risky to be unorthodox. But what I think has happened in the last 10, 15 years with, with the shift into identity politics particularly is an enormous distraction um, of uh, audiences from what happened after the global financial crisis. I mean, that set in motion some extremely damaging processes for millions of ordinary people. And it, in a sense, deranged our system. And it, it came, well, as a bit of a shock, but in a sense, no surprise to me when events like Brexit occurred, when people like Trump got elected, because the world had been really given a massive shove and not in a very helpful direction. But rather than deal with that, I think more and more effort went into, you know, for want of a better term, the culture wars um, went into identity politics. Why? Because it divides society. Um, it, it's almost by definition divisive because what does it focus it on? It focuses on things that you cannot change. Mm. Right? I mean, if you are born black or white, right? You are born gay or straight. I mean, you are born male or female, although, you know. <laughs> That's a debatable yeah. point these days, um, believe right, it or not. Right, right. Um, and so these are things that cannot be changed. And so if you focus on things that cannot be changed, then division is, is baked in. And as long as people are fighting about um, what is a woman, then they're not fighting about how do we fix this system so that food's not going up 20% a year. Um, so that we can house everybody um, who needs a place to live. I mean, while we're arguing about Posey Parker, we're not arguing about um, the enormous economic damage that... And social damage. First, yeah. First, yeah, and social damage that was wrought first by the global financial crisis and then, of course, by the global pandemic. Um, yeah. So while while we're distracted and tearing each other to pieces over things we cannot change, um, then then the things we might be able to change remain unchanged. Yeah, Chris, what a fascinating session! We're getting a huge amount of reaction to this on the text, uh, and I can tell people I won't um, put this behind the pay. We'll we'll put this whole interview up across all our social media today because I think it's been a very important discussion. But just to pat myself on the back again, uh, Chris, I can remember we us having a conversation soon after I'd left Magic Talk and you said, so you're going to build a Fox News in New Zealand, I think was the suggestion you made to me. <laughs> That's right, you I remember, remember the that? conversation. I'd just like to say I, I told you I wouldn't. I don't think I have. No, I don't think you have either. Um, you are the island that the person on the life raft um, arrives at in this strange, strange media ocean. So um, I'm very glad you're there, Sean. Well, I'm very glad that you talked to us uh, this morning, Chris, and I thank you very much indeed. That is our political commentator, journalist, 
Oh, old-fashioned lefty, uh, Chris uh, Trotter.